All right, let's move on to section number six. Uh, in section number six, we're going to talk about understanding BGP address families and uh, BGP attributes. So we're going to start by taking a look at BGP address families and attributes. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at uh, the BGP route selection preferences. Uh, we'll also talk about BGP communities in this particular section. And then we'll wrap up this section by examining uh, a case study uh, designing a dual stack multi-protocol BGP environment. Uh, and then we'll wrap up this section and that'll also wrap up our BGP discussion. Uh, now, in the uh, obviously BGP has been around for quite some time as a protocol. The normal version of BGP, uh, the Border Gateway Protocol, only supports IPv4 unicast prefixes. Uh, but we can also use a, I would say, kind of a newer version of BGP, if you will, called MPBGP or multi-protocol BGP, which supports different types of addresses. It supports IPv4 unicast. It supports IPv4 multicast, IPv6 unicast, and IPv6 multicast. Uh, Multi-protocol BGP is also used for things like MPLS VPNs, where we actually use the multi-protocol BGP protocol, or MPBGP protocol, I should say, uh, to exchange the VPN labels in the MPLS VPN environment. Uh, and for each of these different address types, we use different address families. Uh, and that's what we're going to be exploring in this particular section here. To allow these new addresses, multi-protocol BGP has some new features that the old version of BGP doesn't have. It has something called an AFI, an address family identifier, which specifies the address family that we're actually configuring. It has a subsequent AFI or subsequent address family identifier, which provides additional information for other address families as well. We also have multi-protocol unreachable network layer reachability information, what we call the MP underscore unreach underscore NLRI uh, component. Uh, this is actually an attribute that is used to transport networks that are actually unreachable. Uh, I doubt that we'll actually get into a uh, discussion of that in this particular section here. Uh, we also have BGP capabilities advertisements. This is used by a BGP router to be able to announce to the other BGP routers what capabilities that we support. Uh, MP BGP and BGP4 are compatible. Uh, BGP4 routers can ignore messages that it doesn't understand, but it can also accept the messages that it does understand. All right. Now, since MPBGP supports both IPv4 and IPv6, we have a couple of different options. MPBGP routers can become neighbors using the v4 address family, uh, and then they can exchange IPv6 prefixes or the other way around. And that's kind of what we're going to be exploring in this particular section here. All right. Let's start by talking about the BGP address families and the different attributes that come along with that. Uh, BGP obviously has been around for quite some time, uh, but traditionally BGP4 uh, is BGP for IPv4 routing. Uh, and the primary uh, uh, design or the primary option was to uh, allow us to route IPv4 prefixes uh, over the internet uh, and handle those v4 prefixes. Uh, in about 1993, 94, 95, around that time frame, IPv6 began, uh, uh, was starting to be developed. It actually became, uh, the RFC was published in 1995, and it became a standard in 1995 because of the lack of IPv4 address space and so on. So there had to be kind of a follow on to uh, BGP to allow. Uh, the incorporation of this IPv6 that was being developed. Uh, so modern BGP or multi-protocol BGP uh, has much more capability than just being able to handle IPv4 routes. Uh, like I said before, the address families include IPv4, 
They include IPv6, both unicast and multicast, layer 2 VPNs uh, or L2 VPNs, VPLS or virtual uh, private LAN service, uh, eVPN as well as v uh, VPN v4 addressing and VPN v6 addressing that we use for like a layer 3 MPLS VPN. Uh, also, the subsequent address family identifier was introduced uh, to support tunneling. Uh, and then we also had a multicast distribution tree uh, that was introduced to, to handle multicast VPN traffic as well, uh, and so on. So a lot of advancements in this, uh, in this particular space to be able to support all of these different, all this different functionality. All right. So let's start by talking about the address family that kind of has always existed, in a sense, uh, the IPv4 address family. Uh, as the name implies, IPv4 address family is used when we want to uh, uh, provide for routing uh, of BV, uh, BGP IPv4 prefixes. Uh, and these can be either multicast or unicast prefixes within the address family. We can also create virtual route forwarding instances that can be associated to these various IPv4 address family configurations under the IPv4 address family configuration mode. Now again, this particular class does not get into the specifics of doing this configuration. That's not the goal of this class. Our goal is to understand the general concepts uh, and, and to see how those might apply in a kind of a, a high level design scenario. Uh, to configure multi-protocol BGP on a Cisco device, you need to use the address family command, uh, much like you would see with like uh, EIGRP named mode, where you have address family configurations, um, or in OSPF v3, where you might have address family configurations. Um, we use the uh, uh, address family IPv6 command. We're still going to create the global routing process. Uh, so we would still implement the router BGP and then select our autonomous system number, either our public or private autonomous system number. We would still specify neighbors, even potentially neighbors under the global routing process, but then we can create our, our individual address family configuration. So I might say address-family IPv4 uh, and um, uh, delete a neighbor in that particular case and then go to address family IPv6 and add a neighbor in that particular case by using the no neighbor activate or the neighbor activate command. Um, but the address family command is used to change the settings that we might have for IPv4 or IPv6. All right. Uh, and, uh, and then we can verify the functionality of BGP by using the same BGP commands that we normally would, like a show IP route BGP or a show IPv6 route BGP and so on. Uh, if I want to establish a multi-protocol BGP adjacency with, uh, for both v4 and v6, uh, then I would go ahead and create the address family for IPv6, create the address family for IPv4, use my network statements and my neighbor statements and so on uh, to set that configuration up. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can use in this particular case, because we're talking about IPv4 address families, the address-family IPv4 command. Uh, that is going to take us into a sub-configuration mode. We would enter that command after we've already enabled or at least gone into the, the primary global BGP routing process. Uh, and then the prompt will change to config-router-af, AF obviously standing for address family. By default, routing information for the address family for v4 is advertised when you specify the neighbor remote AS command. So as far as the syntax that we use to establish the adjacencies and the configuration that we use to uh, uh, create these adjacencies is going to be essentially the same. All right. Uh, to configure BGP between two IPv4 routers, we use the, uh, we have to exchange the uh, IPv4 virtual routing information, um, uh, possibly if there's a VPN involved, if we're configuring a VPN. Uh, but the relationship in this particular case is being created with neighbors 192.168.1.2, which is router A, uh, 
uh, in Autonomous System 40,000 and neighbor 192.168.3.2, uh, which is router E uh, in auto Autonomous System 50,000. Uh, and that's certainly possible. We would have to do that through router B, of course, but um, we don't see the specific uh, configuration here, but it is uh, uh, going to look very similar to what our traditional BGP configuration would look like. The only difference being that we're implementing it under address family configuration mode as opposed to in the global routing process. So just like we have the ability to configure an IPv4 address family, we have the, con the ability to configure an IPv6 address family as well. Uh, if I want to configure BGP between two IPv4 peers that need to exchange v4 information, I would use that v4 address family. But the nice thing about multi-protocol BGP is it does support uh, uh, IPv6. Uh, we have extensions that are built into BGP uh, that allow us to run uh, BGP for IPv6, uh, including the BGP uh, IPv6 address family mode configuration to exchange network layer reachability information and next top attribute information for destinations using those IPv6 addresses. Uh, in IPv6 for BGP, uh, it's essentially the same configuration. Uh, the BGP router ID has to be specified. Uh, keep in mind that the router ID is in a dotted decimal 32-bit format. Uh, so if I'm running IPv6 uh, natively, I'm not running dual stack, I don't have any v4 interfaces, I would have to specify the IP, or excuse me, the router ID manually because there's no way for BGP to identify that router ID dynamically. Uh, so because the router ID is, is either manually configured uh, or it's set to the highest active IP address on a loopback interface or it's set to the highest active IP address on a physical interface. Uh, on a BG, uh, BGP device that's only running IPv6, that's certainly not going to be possible. We don't have any uh, V4 addresses that exist on that particular router, so we have to configure the router ID manually. All right. Uh, it's still represented as a 32-bit dotted decimal address. Uh, it often looks like an IPv4 address, but it doesn't have to be an IPv4 address. Uh, it just has to follow that format. So on this particular network, router A connects to two different service providers, a dual multi-homed scenario, uh, where 10, 10, colon, 10, 10, double colon, 64, and 20, 20, colon, 20, 20, double colon, slash, 64 are advertised by AS101. These are our provider independent address space to the outside world. Uh, and then 12, 12, colon, 12, 12, 12, double colon, 64, and uh, 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 which is a, a prefix that exists out on the internet, uh, is going to be received from AS202 and AS303. Again, not really specific to address family mode configuration. I guess the only difference in this case is that we're looking at IPv6 instead of IPv4. All right. So the next type of uh, MP BGP addressing that we talk about is what we call a layer two VPN address family, what we call a VPN V4 address. Uh, whether it's unicast or multicast, it doesn't really matter. Uh, now, I, I do wanna explain kind of the difference between uh, address family IPv4 and VPN V4. A lot of people get those confused. Uh, it's it's kind of simple. Uh, we accept and forward IP packets to customers, right? Uh, and we need to use some sort of IPv4 address family configuration to do that. Uh, but when we're talking about integrating our design with a service provider network, uh, particularly like an MPLS type of network, uh, customer packets are being received at the provider edge router. Uh, we have C routers, which are the customer routers. Those are kind of the routers that sit inside the customer network. We have the CE router, which is the customer edge router. That is the router that's going to be communicating with the provider. We have the provider edge router, which is the router in the provider network that's communicating to the customer. And then we have the P routers, which are the provider only routers uh, 
They kind of sit inside the provider's network. Well, when a route is being received by the PE router, uh, they have to be labeled um, because we have to make sure that um, uh, customer A's routes are distinguished uh, differently from customer B's routes. And this is where a VPN v4 address is required. So in short, we can say that IPv4 address families are used for the customer routes, and then the v, v, uh, VPN v4 address family is used for the service provider core. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we add something called a route distinguisher. It's a 64-bit field. Uh, the 32-bit IPv4 prefix uh, is uh, appended to that, and that's what makes up the VPN v4 prefix, which ends up being about, uh, well, exactly 96 bits long. Uh, then multi-protocol BGP advertises those prefixes between the PE routers. So... Uh, in essence, we have, uh, well, actually, you know what? Let me kind of draw a diagram here. Oops. And show you what I mean. Uh, real quick crash course in the overall architecture of MPLS VPNs, specifically Layer 3 MPLS VPNs. So you have uh, the service provider cloud, right? At the edge, you have a provider edge router. And inside the cloud, you have your P routers, all right? And those go to the provider edge router on the other side. There's some sort of connectivity to the customer edge router. And then inside the customer network, you have your C routers, right? These are all your C routers. Uh, on the other side, you have your customer edge router and then in that cloud, you have your C routers as well. So inside of the customer's network, you're running the customer IGP protocol. Maybe it's OSPF, maybe it's EIGRP, but whatever. You're running some sort of IGP protocol inside your customer network. Uh, in addition, you'll be running some sort of PE to CE protocol. Now, typically that's going to be BGP, but not multi-protocol BGP. Uh, it's gonna be uh, some sort of uh, protocol that allows us to exchange routes between the CE router and the PE router. Uh, and there's also some sort of maybe possible redistribution that's happening between the IGP protocol that you're running inside the customer network and that, uh, that uh, BGP process or whatever process. It doesn't have to be BGP. Uh, it could be uh, OSPF, it could be ISIS, it could be RIP, it could be EIGRP, whatever. Uh, but the idea is that you need to take the routes that exist inside the customer network and you need to somehow uh, exchange those routes with the provider edge router so that the provider now can uh, take those routes and route them to wherever they need to be routed to. Uh, the, the problem that the service provider has to deal with is that they may be dealing with multiple customers. And the service provider doesn't want to have to dictate to the customer what types of prefixes they're going to run inside of their enterprise. So customer A might be using the 10.0.0.0 slash 8 network, and customer B might be using the 10.0.0.0 slash 8 network. Uh, and in that case, there has to be a way to distinguish between customer A's routes and customer B's routes. So on this PE router, we're running virtual route forwarding instances uh, where we have uh, essentially a global routing table, which is used for the service provider network. And then we have VRFs for each customer. So VRF A for customer A, VRF B for customer B and so on. All right, and this is where multi-protocol BGP comes into play. This is where that 64-bit route distinguisher comes into play. The prefixes that I'm learning from customer A is going to have a route distinguisher for A, and the prefixes I'm learning from customer B is going to have a route distinguisher of B. And these provider edge routers, that's where we're running the multi-protocol BGP that allows us to exchange that reachability information. 
We're not running BGP throughout the entire service provider network. We're actually running uh, peering relationships or BGP between the provider edge routers. Uh, so uh, there's another piece to this, of course, MPLS uh, and the core IGP. So inside the network, we're running some sort of core IGP, which in this case most likely is ISIS. Uh, it could be OSPF as well, but a lot of service providers like to use ISIS. And that's to provide reachability between the PE routers. Uh, we have to have a way of being able to establish that peering relationship between those PE routers and the core IGP is what does that. And then the final piece uh, is the MPLS piece <clears throat> excuse me, the MPLS piece that we're running in the network uh, and uh, uh, MPLS is running between these nodes here uh, to be able to provide label path switching uh, at uh, really the data plane uh, to be able to, to pass the traffic back and forth as quickly as possible. So a label would get imposed here uh, and then with penultimate hot popping, we would probably depose the label at this point uh, without PHP, uh, we would depose the label at this point, uh, and then we would, uh, you know, use those VRF routing instances then to take those routes and exchange them back into the customer's network. So we have a similar kind of protocol running on this side, and we're taking those routes that were exchanged through multi-protocol BGP and sending them into the customer edge router, and then finally going back into OSPF. Uh, and that's kind of all of the, the moving parts, if you will, of an MPLS VPN architecture. What we're talking about is one small piece of this, right? The multi-protocol BGP piece, which provides us the ability to exchange that VPN v4 routing information that we've been discussing. Uh, so I wanted to kind of give you guys an idea of, of how this sits into the overall architecture, all right? So uh, let's go back to our book here. Where'd my mouse go? There it is. So it says here that the VPN v4 multicast address family is used to identify routing sessions for BGP standard VPN v4 address prefixes. Unicast address prefixes are the default when VPN v4 addresses are configured. VPN v4 routes are the same as IPv4 routes, but VPN v4 routes have a route distinguisher uh, that is prepended to allow for the replication of those prefixes. Uh, now, we wouldn't necessarily need that route distinguisher if the customers had independent address space, but there's no guarantee of that, right? If the customers don't have independent address space, we have, to way of, we have to have a way of distinguishing routes from one customer uh, to routes from another customer, and that's where the VPN v4 address comes into play. All right. Um, we uh, can also have clients that actually participate in other types of VPNs as well. Maybe they're participating in their own VPN where they're exchanging routes from one, uh, you know, from one network to the other. Uh, but they might also be participating in service provider uh, VPNs that maybe add additional services like uh, um, a uh, uh, voice over IP, hosted voice over IP solution or a hosted uh, security solution or whatever. Um, companies uh, tend to use private addressing internally, right? Uh, and uh, as such, it's highly likely that you would have multiple customers that would be using the same uh, kind of private independent address space. Uh, so we have to be able to, again, distinguish uh, that address space for the, each of the customers, and that's where the VPN uh, v4 prefixes come into play, okay? Uh, the support for address families, especially layer two VPN address families has been around for quite some time. Uh, and uh, uh, it can be incorporated with the use of encryption technologies as well as tunneling techniques like GRE, generic route encapsulation, and um, uh, IPsec as well, okay? Uh, 
In this particular example that we see here, the PE router, uh, N-PE3, uh, is configured with a Layer 2 router ID, uh, a VPN ID, and a VPLS ID. Uh, and it's, it's uh, actually configured to automatically discover the other PE routers uh, that are part of the same VPLS domain. Uh, now, this is a, a discussion that is probably should be prefaced with, you know, what is the difference between VPLS and VPWS? Uh, how does that relate to MPLS and so on? Uh, but I will say this, uh, VPLS, uh, the virtual private LAN service, as opposed to VPWS, which is a pseudo wire, a uh, virtual private wired service. These are just different flavors of MPLS. Um, and uh, certainly we can get into a discussion of how this uh, allows us to communicate and what the differences are between a pseudo wire and a LAN, a virtually private LAN, but it's really not part of this uh, discussion. It's not really part of this, uh, this class. Um, but the idea is that we're creating these BGP sessions uh, and incorporating this layer two VPN address family configuration so that we can share routing information across this VPN. Whether it's a wired VPN service or a, a LAN VPN service, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we use the layer two VPN address family configurations uh, uh, to support the VPLS technology we can do auto discovery uh, mechanisms. We can distribute endpoint uh, uh, provisioning information over the layer two VPN. Uh, we have a separate routing information base to store that endpoint information that has to do with the, the VRFs that I was mentioning uh, and so on. Uh, BGP has the ability to distribute uh, endpoint provisioning information as well to its BGP neighbors. Uh, that endpoint provisioning has to do with how we actually set up the VPLS network uh, by creating this, this mesh of pseudo wires. Remember, VPLS is a LAN service, which means that we have several PE routers that are participating essentially in the same broadcast domain. And we can see that here, actually, uh, in this particular case, 10.10.10.1, 10.10.10.3, and 10.10.10.2 are all in the same broadcast domain. Now, they've drawn this in this particular case uh, where it appears that these routers have physical connectivity with each other. That's not necessarily the case, right? There is a service provider network that's most likely going to be in between these routers, uh, and the P routers would be there. Uh, these are just PE routers, so they kind of took out some pieces of the cloud, if you will, uh, to make the diagram look a little bit simpler. But uh, it is a... Um, uh, uh, kind of the same concept that I had drawn previously. So if we extend that and we take a look at multi-protocol VPNs uh, or BGP for VPN v4, this is more conducive to what I was drawing previously. All right, BGP um, can use uh, these VPN v4 addresses to be able to exchange routing information between autonomous systems. Uh, now, again, they, they still didn't really kind of draw the cloud in, be, in between here. Uh, they're showing the PE routers as being directly connected, but most likely that's not going to be the case. The PE routers are going to be connected over some service provider network, and we're using the VPN v4 addresses to be able to ensure that we have um, uh, ways to distinguish and identify independently the customer's uh, address space. So if we have VPN A1 and VPN A2, that might be customer A. Uh, VPN B1 and VPN B2 might be customer B. But those customers might be using the same RFC 1918 address space. So the VPN V4 prefix is what allows us to identify the difference between those, uh, between those different customers. Uh, and that's how we exchange that information like I said, we're going to have virtual route forwarding configured on these PE routers. We'll, we'll have a global routing table, which allows us to route across the provider's network. And then we'll have the individual VRFs that are assigned to each of the customers uh, 
with those distinguishers, those route distinguishers, to be able to uniquely identify those customers. Okay? All right. So now let's get into a discussion about the BGP route selection process. Uh, BGP routers typically try to receive multiple paths to the same destination. That's pretty much how most dynamic routing protocols work. Uh, we want to be able to have redundant paths uh, for the purposes of, you know, uh, or the purpose of if one of the paths fails, we still have an alternate way of selecting the next path, right? And uh, that's uh, uh, generally, uh, you know, conducive to any dynamic routing protocol. That's the whole point of running a dynamic routing protocol. Uh, but assume that all the paths that the router receives for a particular prefix are arranged in a list. Uh, this list is similar to what you might see, for example, if you do a show IB, IP BGP uh, with the longer prefixes option. All right. Some paths are not considered as candidates for the best path uh, because they do not have maybe a valid flag that indicates that the path is valid uh, and so on. But the idea is that we have to go through a selection process uh, where we decide what path is, uh, is going to be chosen. Uh, now, in the case of an IGP routing protocol, that selection process is based on something very simple, the metric, right? I mean, we have algorithms inside the router that allow us to decide what paths to use, things like administrative distance, uh, to, to, to break the tie between, well, supposed tie, I guess, between learning about the same routing prefix from different information sources. We have longest match routing, but we also have a metric, all right? And metric is, uh, in all, you know, for all intents and purposes, is the cost to reach a destination. Lower the metric, the lower the cost, the more preferred the path. BGP uh, assigns the first valid path as the current best path. Uh, we compare the best path with the next path in the list until we reach the end of the list of valid paths, and ultimately we've selected only one path. All right? Now we'll break down each of these attributes. That's the whole point of this section here. Uh, the weight attribute, for example, a Cisco-specific parameter, uh, but only local to the router that it's configured on. And this is the first attribute that Cisco considers. Then we prefer the path with the highest local preference. Uh, a path with a local preference is considered to have a, uh, a value uh, that's preferred. The default value is 100, but the higher value is going to be preferred in this particular case. Uh, then we'll prefer a path that was locally originated by using a network statement uh, or by using some sort of aggregate BGP subcommand uh, uh, or through some sort of redistribution from an IGP protocol. Uh, that's the actual order that we would select that in, network or aggregate or redistribution. Uh, and always the, the network or redistribute commands uh, within BGP are going to be preferred over local aggregates that are sourced by using the aggregate address command. That, that aggregate address command is what, how we do uh, summaries in BGP. All right. Uh, then we prefer the path with the shortest AS path attribute. Uh, and uh, we can skip this. There is an option to skip this attribute by using the BGP best path AS path ignore command, but typically we don't do that. Um, uh, and AS path is a really simple attribute because it, uh, it uh, is identified essentially as an attribute that is used uh, to identify how many autonomous systems I have to go through to reach a particular destination. Then we will have a path with the lowest origin type, uh, the lowest origin code. IGP is lower than EGP. Uh, EGP doesn't really exist anymore, uh, so that's probably not going to come into play uh, and lower than incomplete. Incomplete is not what it sounds like. We'll break these down in detail in a little bit. Um, incomplete is, is uh, not what it sounds like, though, but we'll talk about that. 
Then we prefer the, the path with the lowest multi-exit discriminator. Uh, this is a attribute, uh, uh, a uh, what we would refer to as a non-transitive optional attribute. Uh, but multi-exit discriminator is only going to be selected for uh, choosing how I reach an autonomous system. But that attribute is set from the receiving autonomous system. It's not set within my own autonomous system. All right, uh, we'll, we'll get into the detail of these, as I mentioned uh, in a little bit. Uh, we'll prefer, prefer eBGP paths over iBGP paths. Uh, that's the next step. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, generally speaking, if I'm learning about a path through iBGP, I should most likely be using my iGP routing protocol to reach those destinations. We should not be relying on iBGP to reach those destinations. Uh, so external paths are going to be preferred over internal paths. Uh, then we prefer the path with the lowest iGP metric to the next hop. Uh, we determine uh, in this case now we're getting down into the weeds a little bit. Uh, but if we have multiple paths that require installation into the routing table, if we have the BGP multipath configuration set up, we'll do that. If both paths are external, the path that's the oldest will be used and so on. Uh, there's a bunch of other steps, right? Uh, there's actually 13 different BGP path selection steps, uh, but we're not going to go through each of these in, in detail here. Uh, we'll focus primarily on some of the most common uh, attributes. So we'll take a look at weight. Uh, we'll take a look at um, uh, local preference. That's a very common attribute. Uh, we'll also take a look at... Uh, uh, AS path uh, and uh, talk about AS path prepending uh, and uh, and maybe take a look at an example of med and and that's pretty much it. Um, you know most of these other attributes we don't really take a look at too much because uh, quite frankly the primary attributes that I just mentioned are usually the ones that we're going to be using to make a path selection. Okay. So let's start uh, by talking about the weight attribute. And then we'll move down to the rest of those attributes that I just mentioned. Uh, the weight attribute itself, uh, let me scroll down here. Uh, uh, some terms here, uh, some acronyms. Uh, AS is Autonomous System. IGP is Interior Gateway Routing Protocol uh, or Gateway Protocol. EGP, Exterior Gateway Protocol. That's not a generic term, by the way. IGP is more of a generic term. EGP, in this case, is actually referring to the protocol called EGP. Uh, Multi-exit discriminator, exterior, uh, external BGP, uh, internal BGP, and so on. Uh, those at, those uh, acronyms we were already familiar with. So let's talk about the weight attribute. Uh, the weight attribute, like I said, is a Cisco-defined attribute. Uh, this attribute uses weight to select the best path. The weight is assigned locally to the router itself. All right. So uh, based on this diagram here, we're, we're talking about this from the perspective of router one. Actually, before we get into the discussion of each of these individual attributes, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you guys uh, kind of an overview of these attributes. It's not in the book. Cisco, again, kind of assumes that you understand this concept and you, and you know this concept, but I would like to kind of uh, 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 discuss this. I think it's important to talk about. Um, let me pull up the document here. Let's see right here. So uh, when it comes to BGP attributes, um, there are... Uh, four things that you need to understand about these attributes, right? Uh, each of these attributes has a specific characteristic that defines whether or not a BGP speaker needs to accept this attribute and utilize the attribute or whether they can ignore the attribute uh, and also whether the attribute moves from one speaker to the next or whether it's just from peer to peer. So we have what we call well-known BGP attributes and we have optional BGP attributes. Well-known attributes are attributes that every implementation of BGP incorporates. Uh, now, whether it's mandatory or discretionary, 
depends on the attribute. But uh, a well-known attribute means that you can pretty much be assured that any vendor that's implementing BGP is going to understand what this attribute is. A well-known mandatory attribute must be understood by all of the speakers, and it also must exist in the BGP update. So when I'm advertising a prefix, this uh, well-known mandatory attribute must be included in that BGP update. Well-known discretionary means all BGP speakers need to understand it, but they don't necessarily need to use it, meaning that we can choose to include that attribute in the update or we can choose to exclude that attribute in the update. Optional attributes are attributes that a BGP speaker may, may or may not understand, all right? Uh, so this could be maybe like the weight attribute uh, is optional because it is a Cisco proprietary attribute. Not all BGP speakers are gonna understand the weight attribute. Uh, transitive means that the attribute moves from one speaker to the next. Non-transitive means I do not pass that information. Uh, I, I can receive that information from a speaker, but I do not pass that information on to another speaker. So that's the first thing you need to kind of understand about these attributes is that these attributes are being, uh, 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 you know, categorized into these different categories. Here's a, a list of all the attributes that exist based on their type code. The origin attribute is a well-known mandatory attribute. AS path is a well-known mandatory attribute. Next hop, a well-known mandatory attribute. Uh, unfortunately, in the book, we don't really talk about all of these different attributes, um, but, you know, that's why I'm kind of going off on this little side discussion here. Multi-exit discriminator is an optional non-transitive attribute. Local preference, well-known discretionary attribute. Uh, and uh, atomic aggregate, well-known discretionary aggregator, optional transitive. Community is optional transitive. Originator ID, optional non-transitive. Cluster list, optional non-transitive. DPA, doesn't have anything to do with that. And now we're getting into kind of the stuff that doesn't really matter, okay? Well, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter necessarily. It's not stuff that we are going to be discussing in detail in this case, okay? Now, when a route, uh, uh, the prerequisites before we can even install a route. Number one, we must have a route to the next hop. Remember, we were, we're, we're exchanging network layer reachability information between BGP speakers. Uh, and just because I'm learning about a prefix doesn't mean I can actually get to that prefix. We see this in OSPF as well. I might be able to learn about an external prefix through a type five LSA, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I can route to that destination if I don't have the appropriate uh, uh, reachability information to say the ABR or the ASBR and so on, all right? The AS path uh, cannot contain my own autonomous system. I, I skipped the synchronization piece uh, because we don't really deal with that too much anymore, uh, but uh, this would be on the edge routers, the, 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 the uh, edge routers of the BGP autonomous system. Uh, basically, it says that all IBGP routes have to have matching IGP routes in the routing information base. Um, and uh, you can turn that feature off or you can turn that feature on. Uh, but we talked about the loop avoidance mechanism. Uh, do not uh, accept routes that contain my own autonomous system uh, and so on. Uh, now, What's really important about this is this part right here, the BGP path selection process. We prefer highest weight first. This is a Cisco proprietary attribute. Now, when it comes to defining these attributes, we define these attributes based on whether or not it influences how we leave the autonomous system or whether or not it influences how somebody enters the autonomous system. And this is where it gets a, a little bit confusing because a 
an attribute that uh, allows us to identify how we leave the autonomous system is called an inbound policy attribute meaning that I am receiving prefix X from the service provider. I am able to apply a weight to prefix X, which would then allow me to decide how I'm going to route to prefix X. That is what we refer to as an inbound policy attribute. All right. Whereas if you look at AS path, AS path could be inbound or outbound meaning that I can use AS path to decide how I'm going to leave the autonomous system. That would be an inbound policy. Or I can use AS path to influence how somebody else might route to my autonomous system. And that would be an outbound policy, meaning that that's a policy that I'm going to be sending out to my peer. All right. There's only a couple of outbound policies. Uh, you can see local preferences inbound. Uh, uh, MED is outbound and AS path is outbound. Those are really the only two outbound policies. Okay, so now let's get into the discussion of these attributes specifically. As I mentioned before, the weight attribute is a Cisco defined attribute. Uh, we use weight to select the best path, but the scenario in which this is utilized is based on, and let's go back to our PDF here, based on the fact that, let's say, AS1 is trying to route uh, to a prefix that's being advertised by AS3. And this is what we mean by an inbound policy. So this path is being routed, or, or, or network X is being sent in to AS1 from AS2, and network X is being sent in uh, to AS1 from AS4. I have to decide which way I'm going to go. So I can set up a route map and do some match and set conditions to say, okay, when I receive prefix X from AS2, we're going to apply a weight of 500. When I see, receive the prefix of X from AS4, I'm going to apply a weight of 400. All right that weight is assigned locally to that router. Uh, and that weight value only makes sense to that specific router. It's not propagated or carried through any of the other routing updates. So it is what we would refer to as an optional non-transitive attribute. Uh, it's not well known um, because it uh, uh, is um, uh, Cisco proprietary uh, and it is not non-transitive. Now, there's two different weight values that you'll typically see in a Cisco environment. Uh, it can The weight value itself can be anywhere from 0 to 65,535. It's a 16-bit field. Paths that uh, the router originates themselves have a weight of 32,768 by default. All other paths have a weight of 0 by default. So uh, you'll see this when you do a show IP BGP, you'll see the weight uh, listed in a Cisco router at least. You'll see the weight listed in the BGP table as one of those attributes that's commonly listed. And in some cases, you'll see a zero. In other cases, you'll see a 32768. That 32768 indicates that that is a, uh, a route that I'm locally originating, meaning I'm the one that's originating that prefix. Uh, the bottom line, though, is that the route with the higher weight value has a preference when we have multiple routes to the same destination. So in this case, we're going to choose to go to AS2 as opposed to going to AS4. All right. Uh, really, really simple concept. Now, uh, I can apply these weights a couple of different ways. Uh, I can apply it directly to a neighbor relationship. Uh, so I could say, okay, for this neighbor, go ahead and apply a weight of 400 for everything from that neighbor. And for this neighbor, go ahead and apply a weight of 500 for everything from that neighbor. Uh, I could do that. Um, I could also use an AS path access list, uh, and I could apply a, a weight to the AS path. Uh, but probably the most common uh, would be to use some sort of route map uh, and then based on that route map, we apply the route map 
to the uh, to the pier. So we might create a route map uh, to set the weight. Uh, that would be an inbound route map that we would apply to the pier, to the pier, and then we would set the weight uh, based on that value. Okay. Uh, so it's a relatively simple attribute to work with uh, because it's only local to the router. Um, and uh, it uh, allows us to decide how we're going to leave that router to reach a particular destination. Okay. Now, the next attribute that we talk about is the local preference attribute. And the local preference attribute is a well-known, uh, well, let's go back to our list here, right? Uh, it is a well-known discretionary attribute. Let me pull up my list here. We can see that local preference is well-known discretionary. Actually, let me go ahead and highlight these points here. Uh, it's a Cisco defined attribute assigned locally by the router, not propagated to other peers, anywhere from 0 to 65,535, uh, 32,768 for paths that I originate, meaning the next top is quad zero, meaning me. A default weight for zero, higher is better. We can use the neighbor command, or we can use route maps. Uh, yep, we covered all that. So local preference, real quick, it's an inbound policy. So it allows us to define how we're going to route uh, out of a network. Uh, and it is a well-known discretionary, but it is a transitive attribute, meaning that uh, it gets set on the perimeter routers, but it gets propagated to the other routers in the autonomous system. The default preference value is 100. The higher the value, the more preferred. And we can set it... Uh, uh, we can set this attribute by applying it to the neighbor uh, as well as um, uh, using route maps to establish this, this uh, um, attribute. All right. So here's a, the diagram. Uh, and in this case, notice we have essentially a dual multi-homed scenario, right? Router 2 and Router 3 are my external routers peering with AS2. Uh, well, maybe. We don't know if these are different ISPs or not, but uh, definitely different ASs, right? AS2 on router 4 and AS4 on router 6. So what has to happen in this case is I have to decide, okay, how am I going to leave this domain? Uh, and that decision is based on two different exit, exit points in the network as opposed to one exit point in the network. Uh, so, and then... Uh, let's assume in this particular case that I'm running BGP on this router here. Let's turn my pin on. Uh, maybe we're doing some sort of IBGP in this case. Uh, and we have eBGP here. Uh, and we're assigning the local preference value of 800 for routes being learned from that peering relationship and a local preference of 700 for routes being learned from that uh, uh, neighbor relationship. That attribute is being propagated over to router one. And router one is going to say, okay, do I want to leave the network through router two to get to network X, whatever prefix is being advertised? That network is being advertised this way as well. Or do I want to um, uh, go through router three? Uh, the higher the number, the more preferred. That means that we're going to end up going through uh, router 4 in this particular case, actually router 2, to leave our autonomous system uh, as opposed to um, uh, router 3 to leave the autonomous system. Okay? Uh, it's actually a relatively simple attribute as well, not too difficult to understand. Uh, it, it, uh, Cisco kind of defines local preference as an indication to the autonomous system about what path, uh, you want to choose to leave the AS to reach a certain destination. Again, the higher the value, the more preferred 100 is the default. Uh, weight is only relevant to the local router. 
local preference is exchanged with all the routers in the AS, uh, assuming they're all running BGP. All right, we set the local preference by either doing a default local preference value. We can use route maps. Uh, so I can create a route map um, and, uh, and, and match prefixes. Uh, and then based on that match condition, I can set the, uh, the um, local preference value for, for uh, prefixes that I'm learning from a particular peer. All right. All right, so local preference is the second strongest criteria that we can use in our selection process. If we have two or more paths that are available for the same destination network, a router will first compare the weight. If the weights are equal for all the paths, then we're gonna take a look at that local preference attribute, and then the path with the highest local preference is going to be preferred. Uh, this local preference attribute does not move from one autonomous system to another. Uh, it will move throughout the entire autonomous system, but once we go to an eBGP pairing session, this local preference value will be, be stripped off. Uh, it is the second strongest uh, BGP selection parameter uh, based on the route selection process. Weight, uh, highest weight is preferred assuming we're running a Cisco environment, being that weight is a Cisco proprietary attribute, uh, and then the highest local preference is going to be selected next. Because we can use both weight and local preference to, to uh, manipulate our route selection process, we have to decide as an administrator which one is going to apply first. Obviously, that's also going to be determined based on the overall topology that we have leaving that autonomous system. A multi-homed single router implementation would mean that we would want to use weight. A dual homed or, or multi-homed dual router configuration would most likely mean that we would want to use local preference in that particular case. All right. So uh, we can apply local preference uh, by setting the local preference uh, using the set local preference command. Uh, or we can apply local preference by using a uh, route map. There is a command called the BGP de uh, default local preference command. That is going to set the local preference on the updates out of the router uh, that goes to peers within the same autonomous system. So almost like uh, establishing a weight for all of the routes that I learned from an adjacent neighbor. Uh, in the case of set default local preference, this is going to set the preference for essentially all of the uh, routes that I advertise throughout the autonomous system. Uh, and again, it's a way for us to determine how we're going to leave a particular autonomous system. All right. In this particular diagram here, uh, we've done a per router default local preference set. Uh, and uh, but we can also uh, manipulate that local preference value by using a route map. Uh, but again, as we leave the autonomous system, whatever local preference is actually set is going to get removed, and that attribute is no longer going to be utilized once we leave uh, we leave that autonomous system. In other words, if we have a a uh, uh, a uh, a way of reaching. Uh, well, a relationship with an external BGP peer, I should say, in this particular case. Uh, in other words, it's basically non-transitive to the area or to the autonomous system, but it's still an attribute that gets propagated throughout the autonomous system. So the next attribute that we're going to talk about is the BGP AS path attribute. Uh, really, really straightforward attribute. Uh, every time a prefix gets advertised through an autonomous system, that autonomous system that is carrying that prefix uh, is going to add its AS uh, information to the AS path attribute. Uh, and that will accumulate as we go through the BGP autonomous systems until we finally reach the destination, uh, or at least where we're uh, the, the, the final location where we're actually advertising that prefix. And uh, once I uh, uh, get to that router and I'm trying to make a decision on how I'm going to route, uh, what will happen is I will just basically look at that AS path 
and I will try to identify uh, essentially what the shortest path is to reach that destination. We can actually manipulate this AS path attribute by prepending uh, either a single time or multiple times our own AS number. Uh, and we do AS path prepending to be able to lengthen or, or arbit uh, you know, um, almost like padding, if you will, the AS path to make it appear as though it's longer than it normally is or longer than it really is to make that a less desirable path. Uh, so essentially, let's say here, if we had, um, as an example in this topology, uh, we're trying to reach the uh, 172.20.1.1 network from router A. Uh, if I was to go this way, the AS path would have a single number, AS6550. Uh, but if I were to go this way, it would have uh, 65538, 65545, 65547, and then finally 65550. Uh, but what I can do is I can do AS path prepending. I could say, okay, for the, for the, when I receive, let's say that we, we do prefer to go the long way from router B to router C to router D over to router E. When I receive the prefix uh, from router E, I'm going to prepend my AS path multiple times, three or four or five or six times, however many is necessary to make that path seem less desirable than the alternate path, the path that I wanna choose to use. Uh, otherwise, the AS path is just really just a uh, accumulation of all the different autonomous systems that the traffic has to go through to reach a particular destination. So normally we would do AS path prepending on an outgoing EGP up, uh, eBGP update uh, over uh, the uh, undesirable path to make that path appear longer. Uh, and uh, uh, in this case, we wouldn't be using weight or local preference or origin to be able to identify the best route. We would ultimately be going up to step number four, which is the AS path. And that's how we would decide to get to that destination. All right. Uh, when the routing information gets propagated uh, from one autonomous system to the next, we'll go through the example that they have here in the book. Uh, uh, one of the methods for th that BGP can use to influence how we decide to take or what path we decide to take through different autonomous systems is the AS path attribute. Uh, this is the... Uh, uh, this is the fourth option in the list, if you will, after weight, local preference, and origin. Uh, so in router A, uh, router A is advertising uh, the 172.17.1.0 network to its peers uh, in autonomous systems uh, 65550 and 65538. Uh, and when the routing information gets processed, and propagated to 65545, then the routers in AS65545 have reachability information about that network from two different locations. Uh, now, if I were to consider uh, AS path without making that modification, so we're talking about going from router C to this destination, the AS path length here would be two autonomous systems, excluding myself. Uh, and the AS path length here would be two autonomous systems. Uh, well, actually, technically three autonomous systems because we um, are going to have 65547, 65550, and then finally the originating AS of 65536. Whereas here we would have just 65538 and 65536. So this would be two, excluding our own autonomous system. Uh, and um, the, the path through router B would be preferred, all right? But what if we don't wanna take the path through router B, right? Then what I can do is I can prepend uh, my own autonomous system onto that AS path attribute, making it longer, ensuring that I would select the other path as the destination. Uh, this is a manual manipulation in the AS path length. Uh, we can't really just simply say choose this path or the other path. 
uh, we don't really have that option um, because we have to use the path attributes to make that decision. That's what we have to use to make the decision. So it has to be one of those uh, methods for choosing. Now, router C does have another option. We could use the wait attribute, right? Because we have a single router making a decision on how to leave the autonomous system. The wait attribute is an attribute that we could use to do that. But let's say it's not a Cisco router. Uh, and in this case, maybe it isn't. Uh, and if it's not a Cisco router, then the only other option we have is to manipulate the AS path attribute. All right. So again, uh, this particular AS path attribute, if we go back to our list here, let me pull that back up again. right here. Uh, we, we didn't talk about the, the, the path locally originated. So let's talk about that real quick. Because uh, that was the third step in the list. Uh, prefer the path that's locally originated, meaning from myself, I'm the one that's originating the route, or using a network or aggregate command. Paths that are sourced by the network statement are going to be preferred over paths that are sourced by a redistribution statement. Uh, so redistributed routes are going to be preferred second. And then paths that are sourced by a summarization are going to be selected third. Uh, like I said, network and redistribute are always preferred over aggregate address. Locally originated routes have a weight of 32,768. We talked about that when we were talking about the weight attribute. We prefer the short, uh, path with the shortest AS path. Notice that this is an inbound or outbound policy. Okay, now it says it's typically an outbound policy. So what does that mean? Uh, it is a policy that allows us to influence how somebody comes into our autonomous system from where they're, you know, based on where they're coming from. Uh, meaning that it's an attribute that we would apply or an attribute that we would manipulate for routes that we're prefixes that we are advertising to our peers. Um, we can choose to ignore this with the BGP best path AS path ignore command. Uh, and we can manipulate the AS path by using route maps uh, and AS path prepending. So keep that in mind. Uh, almost all of these attributes that we're manipulating can be manipulated using the uh, uh, route map scenario and route map configuration. Okay. All right. Now, if I am doing AS path manipulation, all I'm simply doing is lengthening the AS path. I'm extending it by creating extra copies of the AS number uh, to it. I can't add just any arbitrary AS number. I can only add my own AS number. Um, uh, but we, so we don't prepend other autonomous system numbers, only our own AS number. All right. Let's take a look at an example real quick of this prepending scenario and, uh, see what that looks like. <clears throat> so the policy here in AS1 is to prefer that the low speed link is used for backup purposes only as long as the high speed link between AS1 and AS100 is available, that is the path that we should follow. All right, which makes sense. We would rather use the two meg link instead of the 64K link. Uh, now, if we're talking about network 10.0.0.0 slash 24, uh, that is being originated by AS1, uh, we are talking about influencing how the other providers get to us, how ISP1 and ISP2 gets to us. Now, if I was just to be able to, uh, if I was just to allow ISP2 to use the default AS path to make a routing decision, ISP2 would choose the 64K link every time, or the 64K link every time, because that has a shorter AS path than if I was to go from 200 to 100 over to AS1 versus 200 directly to AS1. So uh, if I was just to leave the AS path to its default values, ISP1 would end up choosing the correct path 
to return to uh, AS1 to get to the 10.0.0.0 prefix, but ISP2 would not. All right. So you can see here that what we do for the outbound policy, uh, when we advertise the 10.0.0.0 prefix to ISP2, we prepend our own AS path multiple times. Uh, normally, it would just have the single one. We've added two additional ones. Uh, so the AS path length in this case becomes three. And if I look at this path here, uh, it would go from uh, 100 to 1, which is an AS path length of 2. Very, very simple concept. All right. Again, uh, we can apply this to the neighbor adjacency uh, by using a route map uh, to be able to apply that uh, the process. Okay. When AS200 starts the selection process, for the best route. Uh, it's always going to look at that AS path length after it looks at weight and local preference. Uh, however, if you think about it, weight and local preference is an attribute that ISP2 would have to apply themselves. In our particular case, by manipulating the AS path, we are influencing how ISP2 decides to route uh, on our own, essentially. We're saying, you know what, let's go ahead and see if we can uh, get ISP2 to choose the alternate path by manipulating the AS path attribute, which the uh, uh, ISP2 most likely would, would uh, follow. So for forwarding, uh, if the forwarding path from AS200 uh, goes through AS100 and then to AS1, uh, then that would end up being shorter. If that link is broken, uh, the, the BGP update that we received over the 64K link would still be valid, uh, and we can now start using that slower speed link as a backup. All right. We always prepend the AS path with the AS number of the sender, not the AS number of the receiver. All right. The only valid AS number that we can actually prepend in any of these uh, uh, AS path prepending scenarios is the is the our own AS number? Uh, obviously, that makes sense because if we start prepending other autonomous system numbers, uh, we could actually kind of uh, indicate that we're creating, um, uh, you know, some fa false information, right? Almost like we're we're uh, injecting information that that doesn't actually exist. Whereas having our own autonomous system in there, we know that our autonomous system e exists. So when the edge router in AS200 gets the BGP update, it's going to check that AS path to try to verify if the BGP updates were not propagated maybe accidentally by a routing loop. Uh, and if we were to end up finding our own autonomous system number in the AS path, we're going to then go ahead and assume that that BGP update was already seen in AS200 and our loop avoidance mechanism is going to say, let's go ahead and ignore that particular update. Now, assume that AS1 had, uh, for the uh, manual manipulation, used a different AS and not its own AS and not AS200. Uh, so that loop avoidance mechanism wouldn't come into play in this particular case. Would AS200 now accept that particular update? The answer is yes, right? Because we're not seeing... Uh, uh, my own AS in the system. But the problem uh, could show up later on the stage when we finally uh, reach the actual AS that belongs to that prepended, uh, that, that actual autonomous system number that prepended the AS. Uh, and then that AS would reject the route because it would have found its own AS number somewhere in the AS path as well. All right. How many uh, autonomous system numbers can you inject? It depends on what your overall goal is. Uh, the number of uh, ASs that have to be prepend prepended will really depend on uh, how many autonomous system numbers you're trying to uh, you know, override, if you will. We don't know how many alternate paths might exist in the system. Some paths might have three or four hops or three or four autonomous systems. Some paths might have one or two autonomous systems. So we would have to be, be able to identify that, to be able to identify how many uh, 
AS paths we want to prepend. All right. There's no exact mechanism to calculate that prepending length. Uh, you may have to just uh, kind of uh, guess, if you will. Uh, but there are some some uh, uh, tools that are available to us as engineers to be able to identify how routing is taking place on the internet. Uh, there's the what we call the BGP looking glass. Uh, the BGP looking glass uh, is essentially a collection of uh, BGP route servers that uh, are learning all about the BGP routing information on the internet. They're not actually participating in the routing process, uh, but you can log into these BGP route servers and see uh, what uh, uh, you know how a particular prefix looks to the rest of the world, and you can infer how routing is going to take place based on that information. Uh, and you can uh, establish how you want routing to take place. All right. Two uh, different scenarios in which you would want to use AS prepending. Uh, this scenario that we just described where we have a primary and a backup link, and we're trying to influence how traffic flows based on that primary and back, uh, backup link. And the other scenario would be if we're trying to uh, distribute the load of return traffic. It's very easy for us to control how traffic leaves our autonomous system, how we reach destinations outside of our autonomous systems. It's a lot less easy to control how traffic comes into our autonomous system. Uh, and there's only two attributes that we can use uh, to be able to do that, and that's the multi-exit discriminator and this AS path attribute. So we, can, we can't uh, guarantee load sharing, but we can kind of influence how potentially traffic might enter our autonomous system by manipulating the AS path attribute uh, and then uh, kind of influencing how other uh, uh, systems might decide that they're going to route our, uh, to our autonomous system. Those are the two scenarios that we talk about. Okay. All right. Uh, when multiple connections exist, uh, the attributes that we have, whether it's weight or local preference or even AS path, can only solve some of the problem, right? How do we choose the right path out of our autonomous system? Uh, we kind of talked about this, but, um, you know, uh, and, and that's relatively simple. Let's say AS1 in our particular case, uh, we're saying, how can you make certain that the return traffic takes the right path? Uh, again, it's relatively simple for us to manipulate how we leave our autonomous system, uh, but it's not uh, as simple to understand how we, um, uh, how we might be able to influence somebody coming into our autonomous system. And this is where the multi-exit discriminator app, uh, attribute comes into play. Remember, MED is an optional non-transitive attribute. Uh, uh, Cisco describes it as kind of a hint to external neighbors about the preferred path that they want to take coming into the autonomous system when I have multiple entry points coming into that autonomous system. Uh, MED is also known as the external metric of a route. In fact, when you do a show IP BGP, you don't see MED listed in the BGP table. You see the term metric listed. The lower the MED value, in weight and local preference, it was the higher value, uh, but in MED, it's the lower value that's going to be preferred over a higher value, uh, and we can use the MED attribute, much like the other attributes, where we can apply this as an outbound uh, policy uh, to prefixes that we're advertising to a neighboring router. Uh, now, this is only a suggestion. It is an optional keyword optional, non-transitive attribute. Uh, the non-transitive piece is not as critical. It just means that simply I'm going to advertise this to my peer, and that's where it's going to stay. Uh, this, this attribute is not going to be advertised beyond the peer. But the term optional is pretty, pretty important here. Optional meaning that uh, the, the person receiving this attribute or the router receiving this attribute may decide to accept it or may decide to ignore it. Uh, that's uh, totally up to that, uh, that particular peer. In most cases, they will probably accept it, um, but it's not always the case. 
So the med attribute is a hint to external neighbors about how they're supposed to come into our autonomous system. If we look at the diagram here, uh, we may have some network that's being advertised out of AS1. Uh, and uh, for some reason, maybe, maybe there's a weight attribute or, or in BGP AS100, they're choosing to, to use the 64K link instead of the two megabit link to reach that destination in AS1. So what we can do is we advertise that prefix, we can specify the med value, and if they're choosing to use that med, they will choose the lower number. So it's a hint to the neighbors about what we would like to see when they route to us, uh, when they route to our prefix destinations. So uh, in this particular case, maybe there's a prefix or, or a network hanging off of router one, and that's being advertised to AS3. AS3 is, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure what they're, I guess they're talking about from the perspective of AS3 since it's highlighted. Uh, it doesn't really matter in what direction. Uh, we've got AS1 here, so let's just call this the ISP. Uh, and we have network X hanging off here. We're advertising network X with its appropriate attributes, which can include AS path. It wouldn't include weight or local preference because those don't go to EBGP peers, but med is one of those attributes that can be passed over to an EBGP peer. So when I advertise that prefix over to router two, I advertise it with a med of 200. When I advertise that prefix over to router three, I advertise it with a med of 300. And then it's up to the ISP to decide, do I go this way or this way? If they use the med attribute, then they would obviously choose to go that direction to reach that, 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 that destination. Uh, the default med value is zero. The lower the value, the more preferred. Uh, the med attribute is considered a weak metric uh, in contrast to weight or local preference. Uh, the uh, med is uh, decided after several other attributes, weight, local preference, AS path, and origin code. Uh, but it's also considered weak because it's optional, meaning that you can suggest how you want somebody to enter your network, but they can ignore that suggestion and they can make their own decision on how they want to, to enter that network. For example, as an inbound policy, I could be doing AS path prepending for the network X and I could add additional ASs, AS1 multiple times to the prefix that I'm learning from this side and then AS path would take precedence over the, um, over the uh, implementation of, of med. Even if I actually uh, utilize the med attribute, AS path would be selected first, okay? All right, there are some great, uh, there is some great documentation on Cisco's website about the BGP path selection process with lots of uh, great examples on how those are configured and how we can manipulate them. If you go out to Google and you search on uh, BGP path selection process, you will see uh, one of the first uh, documents that's returned is the, uh, is the document from Cisco about the BGP path selection process. Okay, so let's talk about uh, BGP communities. A community is a BGP attribute that may be added to any prefix. Communities are transitive optional attributes optional transitive attributes, which means that when I apply the community attribute, uh, it's going to be propagated throughout the autonomous system and beyond the neighboring router. But those that receive that community could choose to ignore it or they could choose to uh, accept, accept it, all right? Uh, community is basically a label that gets attached to BGP routes. Uh, a few of these labels have predefined uh, meanings. Uh, the well-known communities are listed here on the diagram. No export, which is uh, hex uh, uh, F. I can't remember how many Fs there are. Uh, it is a, um, trying to think of how large the field is. Uh, FF 
FF, FF, F01. Yeah, that's how big it is. Uh, FF, FF, FF01. Right. Uh, so that would be the no export. Uh, the no export uh, community tells a router that it should only propagate any prefixes with uh, uh, any prefixes this BGP community is attached to over iBGP and not propagate it over eBGP to an external autonomous system, meaning that uh, we're only going to propagate uh, these prefixes over iBGP uh, uh, relationships. The other one is no advertise. Uh, no advertise is FFFFFF02. Uh, and that goes a step further, uh, and it tells the router to not advertise the prefix over BGP at all. Relatively straightforward. Uh, we have a no export subconfed, which is 03, FFFFFF03. Uh, and it uh, does something similar, uh, but in networks using confederations, to limit the number of iBGP sessions that we might have in that BGP environment. And then we have no peer, which is FF, FF, FF04. Uh, and uh, that was defined uh, kind of later in the BGP design process. And it indicates that a prefix does not need to be advertised over a particular peering relationship. Uh, the, there are some user-defined communities that you can uh, uh, instantiate as well. Uh, most routers don't automatically propagate communities. On a Cisco router, you'll actually have to enable that explicitly by using the send community keyword when you're specifying the neighbor relationship. Uh, again, these community values are 32-bit values. That's what I was trying to figure out in my head. I knew it was a bunch of Fs followed by a 0, 1, a 0, 2, a 0, 3, or a 0, 4, but I couldn't remember how many Fs, so I had to calculate it in my head. But it's a 32-bit value. Uh, they do show up as decimal numbers, uh, but uh, you can use a new format to be able to identify the community. It's, uh, there's a command that you can use called IP BGP community new format, and it changes the display format of the communities into two 16-bit values that are actually separated by the colon. The well-known communities uh, show up as uh, uh, no export. Uh, the first 16-bit numbers are normally the AS number of the network that sets the community or, or looks for it. And then the second one is the one that conveys the intent of the information. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, so, for example, uh, AT&T or L3 might use their autonomous system number to prefix uh, what it learns in a community by using their autonomous system number first and then, uh, and then the community string itself after that. Uh, but just think of the community as a tag, and then we can make policy decisions based on that tag. All right, so we're tagging the routes to ensure that we can provide some sort of filtering or apply those community tags to some sort of route selection process that we're implementing within BGP. Any BGP router has the ability to tag those routes, both for things that we're learning from a peer or for routes that we're advertising to a peer. But again, it is an optional attribute, optional transitive, so uh, we can't guarantee that those community strings are gonna be used by other autonomous systems when they're processing the routing information. Any BGP router can then filter routes either incoming or outgoing uh, by or selected routes based on that community information. Uh, but uh, by default, communities are stripped in outgoing BGP updates. That's why I mentioned that you have to enable that feature on Cisco routers. So that 32-bit community value uh, with the new format is split up into two parts. The higher order 16 bits, like I said, contains the AS number of the AS that's establishing the community string. And then the lower uh, 16 bits uh, uh, is there to um, uh, identify the purpose uh, and it's locally significant to the device. Uh, 
Uh, we already talked about the different, the four different uh, uh, predefined actions based on the community setting: no advertise, no export, no export sub confed, and no peer. All right. Now uh, I'll go through it one more time because the book does a, a little bit of uh, of a different description than what I provided. Uh, maybe a little bit more detail. So no advertise again instructs a BGP speaking router not to send the tagged prefix to any other neighbor, including iBGP speakers. The no export, uh, if the router receives an update carrying the no export community uh, value, it's not going to propagate that update to any external neighbors uh, except intruck confederation external neighbors. Uh, and the no export attribute is the most widely used predefined community attribute uh, it is used, by the way, to uh, primarily as a mechanism for ensuring that we're a non-transit AS uh, when we have a, a multi-home scenario. We can use that no export attribute. Uh, the no export subconfed, very similar to no export, but it keeps a route within the local AS or a uh, member of an AS within the confederation. The route is not sent to any external BGP peers or to intra-confederation external BGP peers. Uh, and this is the local AS community attribute. And finally, the no peer is used in uh, situations where traffic engineering control over more specific prefixes re is required, uh, but to constrain its propagation only to transit providers and not peers. Uh, not one that you're going to see too often, actually. Uh, we can apply just like all of the other attributes that we have in the system. We can apply community uh, uh, tags or community attributes by using a route map. Uh, and then we can perform an action based on that tag uh, further on down the line or even locally on the same router that might be applying the tag. Uh, and we would do that based on a route map as well. All right. So the idea is that these communities allow us to provide these labels uh, that we can then make policy decisions on uh, based on the labels that are applied. All right. It is a 32-bit value, uh, and it can be represented as a, as a single dotted decimal number or two 16-bit hexadecimal values uh, separated by a colon, uh, which is the most common. All right. All right. So uh, again, the well-known communities that we talk about, no export, uh, uh, these kind of fall inside of a reserved range. Uh, they have specific meaning. Uh, they were defined in RFC 1997 and RFC 3765. Uh, we've kind of already talked about this, right? The diagram here is talking about uh, uh, applying a no export community and then R2 in AS24 is making a decision based on that no export value. All right. Uh, again, it's we can apply the community values, uh, but we still have to have a policy that's going to take action based on those values. And in this particular case, AS24, specifically router two, was programmed to do that. Uh, these are predefined. All right. Um, and that's just a kind of a generic representation of that. So the community attribute, as I mentioned, is a 32-bit transitive optional BGP attribute. Uh, and uh, we apply it to prefixes that we're advertising or prefix information that we're receiving from a particular uh, a peer. All right. What are some of the use cases for these community attributes? Uh, well, it's almost like uh, a scenario in which we do route tagging, right? We use route tagging scenarios and, and an IGP routing protocol to tag routes. Uh, and then if we have some sort of policy, like a redistribution policy, for example, we can make decisions on what routes to redistribute and which routes not to redistribute based on that route tag. Uh, it's essentially the same thing. The only difference in this particular case uh, 
is we're doing this from a community uh, with a community attribute. Uh, and uh, the purpose is to tag routes uh, so that we can identify, you know, what type of attributes will apply to those particular routes, either outbound or inbound. We can act on those tags. We can filter traffic based on those tags, uh, both inbound and outbound. Uh, and uh, we can match against those community lists uh, to, to apply a similar or standard policy to multiple routes that are tagged with different communities by utilizing the community list. But for the most part, this is all done. To, uh, uh, communities are used to establish a administrative policy within our, uh, in our overall configuration. Let's say we need to figure out what to filter at what point and how to modify uh, route attributes to influence traffic flows to suit whatever requirements we might have listed in our organization. Uh, maybe the cost of routing traffic over a particular link uh, is uh, detrimental, right? It costs a lot more to use one link versus the other link. So we want to create some sort of routing policy that says, based on this routing policy, we'll choose one link or the other. One of the things that you'll find with BGP is that you have lots and lots of choices uh, with how you decide to do that, right? You have lots of choices um, on how to influence that overall path selection process. So maybe communities isn't the best option. Maybe we can use AS path prepending, or maybe we can use weight or local preference. Uh, so it really depends on the overall scenario and the design and what you're trying to accomplish as to what type of attribute you might use to achieve that particular goal, okay? So uh, we have to design a community scheme in the case where we're going to be using a particular community to meet whatever goal it is that we're trying to meet. When our policy gets defined based on that community scheme, uh, the deployment of that community system can be done by utilizing route maps and, uh, and uh, uh, using various set and match conditions within those route maps to set those values and, and take action based on those particular values. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Does that make sense? So these community attributes can be used to influence how we, uh, uh, you know, what we do with these particular routes. By, by changing that community attribute on branch two, I can influence how the headquarters applies the local preference value to those particular prefixes. And in turn, uh, uh, through, through uh, association, I guess, we can influence how routing uh, takes place. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, final part of our section here, which is section 6.5, examining a case study, designing a dual stack MP BGP environment. All right. Dual stack, meaning that we're running both IPv4 and IPv6. All right. Uh, so uh, a dual stack deployment uh, does place additional loads on a router uh, because you are running essentially two separate protocol stacks on that router. So we're going to have different routing information bases. We're going to have different forwarding information bases for each of those uh, protocol stacks. Um, that's not really a big concern here. Uh, that's not what we're trying to achieve in this case. Uh, uh, or, excuse me, that's not what our major concern is in this case. In this case, we're just simply trying to achieve the ability to run IPv4 and v6, but it is something to consider. Uh, there is always going to be some sort of increased memory requirement when you have additional prefix information, when you have additional data structures, different TCP relationships, and so on. Additional processing is needed because we have different peering relationships that are being built as well. Uh, basically separate BGP sessions for both IPv4 and IPv6. 
All right. So uh, multi-protocol BGP uh, would be something that we would want to consider in this particular case. Uh, and this is what they say about that. The techniques and mechanisms provided by BGP v4 are also available for multi-protocol BGP for handling IPv6 net, uh, um, uh, network layer reachability information. Uh, the scalability mechanisms, uh, the policy features, the decision process that we use are not specific to IPv4 reachability. They do uh, uh, apply to v6 as well. In other words, what they're saying here is that the policy decisions, the past election process, everything that we've essentially learned about BGP in relation to IPv4 is going to apply to IPv6 as well. A route reflection, MED, confederations, route filtering, uh, all of these concepts are the same in multi-protocol BGP uh, as we see in, um, in, uh, in uh, BGP v4. All right, BGP does run on top of TCP. Uh, it's an application layer protocol. Uh, so it, that means that it essentially operates exactly the same for v4 and v6 because it doesn't operate at the network layer. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what the transport is. It doesn't matter whether the transport is v4 or v6. Uh, there are no changes. Uh, there are two fields in the BGP messages that are IPv4 specific, the router ID and cluster ID, being that the cluster ID is based on a similar concept as the router ID, which uses a 32-bit data decimal address. So in that particular case, a dual stack environment is not an issue. We can establish the cluster ID and we can establish the router ID based on the active v4 interfaces on the platform. Uh, but if you're running v6 only, you would have to manually configure those. All right. The BGP open message, which is a message that allows us to establish a BGP peering session, uh, contains that router ID field, which is four bytes. Uh, this does not mean that it has to be a valid IP address. It could be 0.1.0.1 .1 if you want it to be, uh, but it does have to follow that 32-bit dotted decimal format. Uh, we talked about this before. We can manually configure that router ID or the router will automatically generate a router ID based on the highest active IP address on a loopback interface, uh, which, by the way, uh, that loopback interface does not have to be running BGP. It doesn't have to be part of the BGP process. It just has to be in an up-up state. Or it could be the highest active IP address on a physical interface. Uh, if we don't have a router ID, then the BGP session is simply not going to start. All right. The cluster ID is a component of BGP as well. It also requires a unique four byte number uh, and it's used on route reflectors that we, we talked about that uh, uh, before. It's carried in that network layer reachability information in the BGP update messages. Basically, it's kind of an attribute, if you will of the routes that are being advertised in BGP. Uh, if the router ID is set, then that's going to end up being what the cluster ID is set to as well. Uh, we can also manually configure the cluster ID. But again, because it's based on a 32-bit data decimal address and, uh, and, and could be based on the router ID, if the router ID can't be established, then a cluster ID can't be established. Uh, and that would cause issues as well, OK? Uh, IPv6 has always been a classful routing protocol. Uh, it's never been classless, like, I, uh, excuse me, I said that backwards. Uh, IPv6 has always been a classless routing protocol. It's never been a classful routing protocol, so we don't have to worry about things like auto summary and so on. So let's take a look at a example, a sample configuration. Uh, this is the address family configuration. Uh, very, very similar. As you can see, we still use neighbor statements. We still use, uh, uh, you know, update source and, and whatnot. Our, our network statements are slightly different uh, in that we're using uh, prefix notation instead of dotted decimal notation with the mask command. But overall, the, the configuration is, is very similar. Uh, we can see the address family style configuration here based on the concept of 
defining the peering relationships or the neighbors that uh, are part of our BGP configuration. Those neighbors are then activated under the address family it's, itself. Um, so for example, if we see uh, under router BGP 6500, we are implementing neighbor relationships in the global routing process. That would be my BGP four process, my BGP for IPv4 process. Uh, and then I create address family IPv6 and I activate neighbors specifically under that process. All right, uh, by default, IPv4 network layer reachability information is on for all BGP sessions. We can disable that by doing the no BGP default IPv4 unicast command. You can see that listed there. Uh, and uh, then we don't assume that we're going to automatically send uh, IPv4 information over those V4 neighbor relationships. The process of injecting an IPv6 prefix into BGP is the same. We have to have a network statement. The network command uh, can be used to uh, establish that we want prefixes to be added. The same rule applies in IPv6 as it does in IPv4. In order for that network to be advertised into BGP, that network has to exist with that exact prefix length in the routing table. Uh, so if there is no 2001-400-0 ABCD double colon slash 64 prefix in the routing table, then, uh, then BGP is not going to uh, see that information, okay? Uh, there are a couple of different methods for filtering and matching prefix information based on prefix lists and access control lists. Uh, we use prefix lists primarily in BGP because not only do we want to filter on the prefix itself, we want to be able to filter on the prefix length. Uh, now it's a little bit beyond the, the scope of this particular class um, to uh, get into the, the details of how a prefix list works. Uh, but in essence, this prefix list is identifying exact matches. We're not using the operators of less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Uh, so in that particular case, it becomes a, an exact match. Uh, we, we're not seeing how this is necessarily applied, but each of these prefixes are an exact match. So if I have, depending on where the prefix list is applied, how it's applied in the filtering process, will determine what's actually happening. But based on sequence number five, I'm permitting prefix 2001 400 double colon slash 29. That's an exact match. We're matching against this very specific prefix. Uh, if I was to use say a less than or equal to or greater than or equal to operator, it changes essentially how the prefix list functions and the prefix list ends up being uh, kind of two parts if you will. We're going to match on the bits of the address uh, in the first portion, and then we're going to match on the length of the actual subnet mask in the second portion. Whether it's greater than or equal to a specific subnet mask length or less than or equal to a specific subnet mask length, it just depends. Okay? All right. So let's get into our actual case study now and uh, take a look at what our goal is in this case study. Uh, this case study begins with a simple V4 network in a route reflection environment. All right, the network has three core routers, R1, R2, and R3. They are route reflectors and have a full IBGP mesh with each other. The network also had three route reflector clients, R4, R5, and R6. Uh, I'm assuming R6 is a route reflector client of R1 and R4 and R5 are gonna be route reflector clients of R2 and R3 uh, based on how they've drawn the diagram here, but um, that may not be the case. I'm not even sure if that's really critical in this particular case. Each router has a V4 loopback address that we're using to establish the IBGP sessions. The loopback addressing scheme is 10.1.1.x where X is the router number. ISIS is the IGP used for internal reachability for those BGP sessions, meaning that the loopback addresses have to be reachable. 
uh, and we're using ISIS to establish that reachability. All right. It doesn't really matter what how we decide we're going to be able to reach those loopback interfaces. We just have to have reachability, and that's always a requirement in BGP. Whatever addresses you're using to establish your peering relationships obviously have to be reachable. They can be reachable through a static routing process, OSPF, RIP, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But in this case, they're using ISIS. Uh, that was chosen because it offers uh, integrated IPv6 functionality, not that EIGRP can't or OSPF, uh, but ISAS runs over the data link layer and doesn't run over v4 and v6. This allows the v4 and v6 prefix information to be carried within the same protocol uh, with the network topology independent of the IP version itself. Okay, well, that's a valid argument, um, but... Again, we could accomplish the same thing with OSPF v3 uh, and uh, similar in EIGRP, although with EIGRP we would have to have separate processes running for v4 and v6, but we could still use named mode EIGRP to make it a little bit more efficient, at least from a configuration standpoint. So here's the initial configuration of router one. Uh, we're gonna start by enabling AS65000 uh, we're going to set a neighbor of 10.1.1.2 remote AS65001. So we're establishing that relationship between uh, router one on the left and router one on the right. I think that's probably a typo. Um, but uh, this is our eBGP peering relationship that we're establishing. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, now, we would most likely have to have another part of this configuration. I'm not, I'm not sure that it won't show up later on, but when you're peering with eBGP peers, uh, they have, there's a, a time to uh, a hop limit of one hop. Anything over one hop is, is going to be unreachable. So we would have to either uh, ignore that uh, or we would have to set the eBGP um, multi-hop parameter um, to be able to go more than one hop, but maybe they'll add that a little bit later on, okay? So uh, we're creating, uh, we are also specifying the update source uh, because with any packet generated by a router, the source of that packet is always going to be the egress interface that that packet goes out of to reach a particular destination. We don't want that. We want the source to be the loopback. All right, this is the R1 configuration for 65001, uh, kind of a mirrored configuration, if you will, okay? So the IPv6 BGP deployment follows the same topology as v4. The core routers R1, R2, R3 act as route reflectors. For the v6 prefixes, the edge routers 4, 5, and 6 should, set up, uh, should be set up as route reflector clients. So here are the steps for configuring the BGP network. Step one, if IPv6 forwarding is not enabled, IPv6 packets will not be routed. So the first thing that you have to do uh, is to enable IPv6 unicast routing. This is not required to configure v6 on the interfaces. Uh, uh, router interfaces have the ability to have v6 configured on them without IPv6 routing enabled. They basically just become host uh, interfaces or host uh, hosts in the v6 domain. So that's a really important concept. But if you try to implement a v6 address family without implementing the IPv6 unicast routing command, it's not going to work anyway. Uh, but that is to enable v6 routing globally on the router. Step number two, the BGP router ID should be manually set for each router. Uh, this ensures that if IPv4 was ever removed from the network, the BGP sessions will remain active. We do this under the global BGP routing process by using the command BGP router dash ID and then specify the value. Again, it doesn't have to be an IP address, but it does have to follow the 32 bit data decimal format. Step number three, configure a loopback with an IPv6 address. Just like in v4 sessions, this is going to be used to form our MPBGP sessions. Uh, 
Configuration of addressing on all internal links is not necessary because link local addressing can be used for forwarding. So whenever you enable IPv6 on an interface, which you can do by using the IPv6 enable command on the interface, those interfaces are going to generate what we call a link local address. Uh, they're going to start with FE80, um, double colon slash 10, uh, and then uh, it'll use an EUI64 process uh, and the MAC address of the interface, or it'll borrow a MAC address from another interface if it's a serial interface, uh, split that MAC address in half, drop in an FFFE, invert the seventh bit, append that to the FE80 prefix, and that becomes the link local address. Nice thing about link local addresses is they can be used for routing. They're not routable themselves, but they can be used as next hops for the routing domain. So, and they can also be used for establishing adjacencies and maintaining adjacencies and so on. So by just simply enabling IPv6 on those transit networks, on those transit links, we're able to establish adjacencies and we're able to communicate using those link local addresses. Uh, if we need those particular prefixes or those particular interfaces to be routable, we would have to set up global unicast addresses on those interfaces in order for them to function. But if they're not, if they don't have to be routable, then that's not uh, a necessity in this case. All right. So that's what they're talking about in this particular case. Just go into the interfaces and do an IPv6 enable, uh, and that will enable automatically create those link local addresses on those interfaces, and then we can use those link local addresses for routing. Step number four, enable the IPv6 IGP. In this case, it was ISIS uh, that we're going to enable. Uh, and we use the IPv6 router ISIS command. Of course, we would have to go through and set up all of those settings as well. Uh, configure ISIS for full functionality. Uh, step five, with the foundation in place, we can now configure our v6 BGP sessions. This is done under the BGP configuration, but with address family mode. All right. And then we're going to decide how we're going to advertise prefix information, inject the V6 prefix information under the address family by using the various network commands. All right. So IPv6 loopback addresses are configured on each router. They uh, have the form of 2001 0400 colon zero, colon zero, colon one, two, three, four, double colon X, where X is the router number slash 128. Uh, they're just host routes, right? We don't need a, a full prefix on those interfaces to be able to reach those destinations. Um, so if we do a show IP BGP summary, that should show us if we have our adjacencies and if we're receiving routing information. We can see this is on router one. The router ID is 10.1.1.1. It's in AS65000, so this is the left router one. Uh, BGP version is 5, meaning multi-protocol BGP. We have four separate neighbors. Uh, 2001 400 0701 double colon 701, running BGP v4. Uh, 2001 400 01234 double colon 2, double colon 3, and double colon 6. And if you look at the highlighted section, the highlighted section is what describes essentially how many prefixes we're learning from that particular peer. All right. Um, so very similar output to what we would see in, uh, you know, standard BGP v4. Uh, we're learning one prefix from this neighbor, two prefixes from that neighbor, two prefixes from that neighbor, and so on. All right. All right. Also, the uh, show IP, IP BGP or show BGP IPv6 shows me my BGP table. Also, very similar, uh, almost exactly the same, as a matter of fact, to what I would see with IPv4. On the left column, we can see which paths are valid, uh, and the the um, Asterix indicates which paths are uh, actually valid. The ones that are best are the ones with the greater than symbol. Um, the code, uh, it's missing the asterisk right here. Uh, 
in the in the actual table, the status code table, there should be uh, an asterisk in front of valid there, indicating that uh, that the path is valid. It's not a dash. It should be an asterisk. Uh, valid meaning that there's no like routing information base failure. Uh, it, it's a it, it's a path that we could route to if we need to. Uh, the greater than symbol indicates that you know, how we're actually getting to that particular destination uh, or that's the de uh, that's the path that we're using. So in this particular case, we have two ways of getting to that destination. We have two ways, uh, actually only one way of getting to that destination. Uh, we only have one way of getting to that destination. Uh, the rest of them, actually, we only have one way of getting to. So only the top path we have multiple ways of getting to that particular destination. And that's where the BGP path selection process comes into play. Um, you know, in this particular case, these this prefix is being originated inside of the autonomous system. Uh, so it doesn't have an AS path. Um, but uh, you can see, for example, that the... Um, 2001-400-0701-701 path... Uh, is coming from AS65001. The formatting is a little bit messed up here. Um, it should, uh, I think it's kind of squished on the page there. But the, the main thing here is uh, that the output, the table is similar to what we would have seen if we were using standard BGPv4 and IPv4 prefixes. The only difference is the next top attribute is a V6 destination and the network is a V6 destination as well, okay? If I wanted to see uh, the routing information or the path information for a specific prefix, show IP, uh, or excuse me, show BGP IPv6 and then specify the prefix, we see essentially uh, all the details for this particular path. Uh, the MP BGP 32-bit dependencies are shown here, the cluster ID, the originator ID, are shown, we see the cluster list and the originator ID, uh, which come from that uh, uh, router ID. So 10.1.1.2 and 10.1.1.1 are the respective router IDs that are responsible for managing. Those are the route reflectors, essentially, for this particular destination. Uh, and um, uh, we're, we're actually learning this. This is on router five. So let's see, let me go back up to the diagram here. So router five has a relationship with router three and router two uh, and router one. So we have three route reflectors here. It looks like we have two different clusters based on this output. Router two and router one are acting as a route reflector redundancy group and router three and router one are acting as a route reflector redundancy group in this case. They said in the beginning of this that all three of those routers were route reflectors. The cluster list kind of allows me to identify how those routers are paired together in a particular cluster. Um, and we're seeing that here. Uh, one and two, or two and one are grouped together and three and one are grouped together for redundancy purposes. All right, so one is basically acting as a backup in this case for both clusters, router one, okay? Uh, which kind of makes sense because it's at the top there. So this is the final configuration example. A little bit hard to read. Uh, I think it's actually listed down here. But man, no, they don't have the whole thing there. But the final configuration is listed here in this example. External peers with a prefix list applied uh, to the inbound uh, to permit particular address blocks. If I kind of zoom in here, we've set up a peer group. The peer group configuration allows me to kind of apply common characteristics or common configurations to particular neighbors. Uh, and um, uh, so we don't have to duplicate configurations over and over again. Uh, so we can see we have uh, essentially two different neighbors specified here. Um, we have uh, the 10.1, actually three neighbors, 10.1.1.2, 10.1.1.3, uh, and 10.1.1.6. Uh, 
Uh, and in essence, these guys are inheriting the characteristics of those peer group configurations. Um, I'm not sure why they have neighbor uh, route reflector peer group listed twice. I think that's a typo. Um, I'm looking at the configuration. I'm trying to see. Yeah, there's definitely something not not configured correctly here because we can see the peer group that's applied to the 10.1.1.2 and 10.1.1.3 routers is IPv4 underscore route reflector. Um, and I'm not seeing that peer group defined. And then we see for 10.1.1.6 peer group IPv4 underscore route reflector client. Uh, maybe it's just the image is not good. Um, and there is an underscore there. We're just not seeing it. Uh, but that should match the, uh, the peer group that we've created. What I'm not understanding is why they have it there twice, right? Because if you look at the highlighted peer group at the top, let me see if it's better on my output here. Yeah, I, I think it's supposed to be IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, so there's a typo there because they, they, they do want to establish different parameters for the V4 and the V6 configuration. Uh, so I believe that one of those is supposed to say IPv6 and one is supposed to say IPv4. Um, yeah, definitely. Because if you look lower down, we can see the neighbors that are defined under the address family for IPv6. And we can see that the neighbor peer group that's being applied is IPv6 underscore route reflector and IPv6 underscore route reflector client. But that peer group information is not established under the BGP process. So um, that is definitely, um, well, no, that that's correct because we would we would define the route the, we would we would define the peer group parameters uh, under the address family for IPv6, and it is being applied correctly in the address family for IPv6. But there's definitely a typo there. All right, I think you guys get the general idea though. All right. So in our summary, the subject of IPv6 is extensive and many standard details, uh, many standards detail the operation of IPv6. BGP has been modified to work with IPv6 check. The core of the BGP protocol remains the same. Only significant changes um, is the only significant change is the larger address format. I don't entirely agree with that um, because BGP uh, for our, our IPv6 in general does add several other features, uh, particularly in terms of authentication and encryption, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, how we establish next top information based on link local information as opposed to global unicast. But yes, from a configuration standpoint, the syntax is relatively the same. The only difference is the addressing format. Uh, dual stack is the primary method for deploying IPv6. And uh, that means we're running V4 and V6 at the same time. And eventually we could uh, remove the V6 configuration altogether. All right. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up this section here. That also concludes our discussion about BGP. Uh, and uh, we do actually have a uh, one more brief section that we're going to go through, uh, a case study uh, where we're going to design an enterprise network with BGP internet connectivity. Uh, and that'll be our section number seven. So we'll see you guys there.